I see that Bill is uh, ensconced in his car in the middle of a rainstorm on the top of a mountain near Angel Fire. <laughs> just, Billy, just one more thing. If you would just make me a co-host one more, make me co-host, not host. Right. So, so I can help. Done. And can you remake me a co-host? Because that went away. Oh yeah, I did. Uh, I did fool with you a little bit, John. So let me find you first. Uh, where are you? Here you are. Okay. So you want me to make you a co-host? Oops. Ah. Participants. Here. And actually, let me just say one thing to those of you who are co. I see. I see. There's now three people recording. Four. Okay. Hopefully that'll work. Okay. All right, are we ready to go with uh, with Bill? Say when. Billy, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, okay. So take, take it away, Bill, and other people please mute. Um, well, I have a poem uh, based on a, uh, a phone call from Amit. Uh, many of us have gotten those phone calls and they're delightful. And they come all the way from Delhi, India. Uh, this poem is called Blue Mountains Nilagiri. Phone call this morning, sunrise from Amit, dear friend in New Delhi. That Dantean hellscape that is his hometown now. He told of wise tribes folk in far south of his vast land who give everything there a personal name. The pebble that stubs many toes, every tree, each child, each tiger. None are without honor, name, and notice. Not one generic, not one overlooked. No one is lost in a sea of numbers, in an ocean of souls. As neighbors die of COVID, on his left, on his right, as a hundred mourn unwisely gathered nearby for one who is gone, this poet Amit sings softly of a proud tiger's eyes in blue mountains wild to ears of a sad child to the unanswering sky to any who dare ask why. Thank you. And now I would love to introduce, and I don't know if these poets are here, but I hope they are. I would love to introduce Jack Hirschman, Poet Laureate Emeritus of San Francisco, author of The Arcanes, proud member of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. Are you here, Jack? I haven't seen that. Him. You see him? I have not seen him. But... Right. We'll wait for Jack. And I would love to introduce Adrian Rice. Are you here, Adrian? Nope. Um, then we're going to introduce Indran Amirthanayagam. Are you here? <laughs> Three strikes and you're out. Um, how about Marcel Delgado? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Indra. 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 I'm going to Hi, Good. U.S. diplomat born in Ceylon, now Maryland based poet, translator, author of Uncivil Wars, The Migrant States, and Blue Window. Indra. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I'll read for in honor of our, of our poet, founder of Delhi Poetry this um, from the blue window. Hopefully um, 
sunlight and, and good health will come. Um, and not uh, for him and for all. Um, here are some uh, from the, towards the end of the book, a poem called uh, Trip. Uh, I'll read the original Spanish and then the English. Viaje. Estamos de viaje, cada uno por su cuenta, tú hacia la montaña, yo al mar, tú con nuevos amigos y con tiempo para reflexionar, yo a ver a mi hija, el fruto del pasado, y a unos amigos todavía en este lado del mar. No sé qué provecho sacar del contraste, montaña, mar, amigos nuevos, una hija alta y bella, casi un adolescente a punto de despegar. ¿A dónde? A una nueva ciudad, al futuro que le espera otra vez en el padre. A mí no me gusta lo impermanente y darme cuenta del límite de la costa. ¿Qué opciones me quedan? No regresar, no dar algún consejo a este ser vivo al que ayudé a caminar. Guardar el silencio cuando cada memoria quiere hablar. In the translation of Jennifer Rathbun, thank you, trip. We are on a trip, each one of us on our own. You towards the mountain, I to the sea. You with new friends and time to reflect. I to see my daughter, fruit of the past, and a few friends still on this side of the sea. I don't know how to take advantage of the contrast, mountain, sea, new friends, a tall and beautiful daughter almost, an adolescent ready to take off. Where to? A new city, to a future that awaits her again without her father. I don't like the impermanent and realize the limit of the coast. What options are left for me? Not return? not give some advice to this living being whom I helped teach to walk. Keep silent when every memory wants to talk. In pocas palabras todos, es un poema de tres versos, three lines. En pocas palabras todos, nacen, crecen, se enamoran, se decepcionan, sobreviven, se enamoran, sobreviven, se alegran, dejan de crecer, disminuyen, se mueren. In a few words, everyone is born, grows, falls in love, is disillusioned, survives, falls in love, survives, is happy, stops growing, diminishes, dies. And I'll finish with them. Um, a poem called Illusion, which um, actually I'll, um, I think I have four minutes. I think I have time for one more poem, one uh, illusion. I'll just read the English. Um, behind the Repsol station, we walked to, we, sorry, behind the Repsol station, we walked towards the park where with our hands intertwined, we fell in love. And from that first afternoon, the station became the leg, an encounter of a love made of walks towards multiple green spaces in this hazy city, built next to freezing waters and gas stations. A modern love that depended on public and private transport to take us closer to the Alameda, where in another city in America, a man used to walk around with his armadillo. You are the sea, the tree, the stone road, the smell of gasoline. I am the parishioner, the explorer, the representative of distant countries where other loves arise in their own parks next to waters surrounding everyone, even in the middle of the desert, like that of Paracas. I leave my post, I enter the sea. You leave your coral reefs and your rock formations where boats have sunk to overwhelm the seashore. 35,000 men were erased from the Sri Lankan coast that day of the tsunami. Let me be one more. Thank you. Gracias.
your volume bill. Okay, thank you very much. Thank no, you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do not see my brother uh, Man Manuel Gonzalez here. So um, given that he is not here, I'm going to give everything back to you, Billy. There you go. You're muted, Billy Brown. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> uh, and so um, it's time to introduce our guest of honor, Amit Dahi Yavadsha from Delhi, India, a powerful poet, a compassionate human being, a warm and wonderful friend, uh, a brother in poetry to me and to us all. Um, Please welcome Amit Dahi Abad Shah. Amit, are you with us? Very much so. Thank you. Thank All right. You, uh, um, I want to start with a poem which is probably between 5,000 and 8,000 years old, arguably one of the oldest poems ever written. And it is an invocation to the sun as a father, as a god. Um, it goes like this. Om Bhur Bhuvaswaha Tattavitudvarenyam Argo devasya dhimai Yo yo na prachodayat swaha Om bhur bhuva swaha Tatsavitur varenyam Argo devasya dhimai Yo yo na prachodayat swaha it invokes the sun to, um, to uh, bless us with its lumens so we might tell right from wrong and choose the best way ahead. Uh, that, that is just a, a rough uh, tran translation. You know, I've come to realize now at this stage of my life that um, we are all poets. The difference is some of us know it, most of us just don't know it yet. And for the greater part, uh, and speaking for myself, uh, I see poetry is a craft. Um, the art lies in knowing when to stop. So my first offering is, is a poem that is arguably the shortest poem in the world. And it's, uh, the title is longer than the poem. The title is Terror of the Terrorist. Peace. And um, since I didn't have anything else to say on that subject, I felt that I should just leave it at that. Um, but every time I think of terror and the time we live in, Somehow I'm drawn uh, to the urgent need to write poetry for children. I believe that our defeating, our defeating uh, COVID depends upon our ability to save our children. That is the most urgent need of the hour. This poem is called The Sparrow. By the kitchen window where it's narrow, there always comes a little sparrow. The sparrow is sweet and very neat. It always looks for things to eat. My mama says it's good to share. So crumbs of food are always there. The sparrow takes them to its nest. 
it also shares. And that's the best. But this brings me to back to the subject of terror, uh, the greatest terror of all. And this poem illustrates to me that that um, the space between words in poetry is at least as important as the word itself. And in this poem, I've tried to illustrate it. It's called The Greatest Terror of All. And this is the greatest terror of all. It is the terror of the child who cries out into the dark, Ma, where are you? And receives only silence in reply. Children's obsession with food is enshrined in this little poem called Curry. Hurry, mommy, hurry, hurry, I want to taste potato curry. Onion, garlic, pepper, ginger, may I taste it with my finger? No, no, darling, get a spoon. The curry will be ready soon. But you know, coming back to terror, uh, terror doesn't just lie in a combo of uh, planes and buildings, men with beards and strange accents, guns and bombs. It also lies in many other things. For instance, there's terror in a rice tin. And this is the terror of the rice tin. It is the terror of the young woman who married for love but it did not last nine months. But the children kept coming for five years until the day he finally left. Now there is terror in the fifth week of the month. When she reaches into her rice tin and her cup comes up half empty and her children's eyes accuse her of marrying for love. Children don't talk about um, growing up. They talk about growing big. When I grow big, I shall have a bicycle with a shining bell. Behind me, a carrier will carry my sister well. In front, I'll have a basket to hold all of our things. A bat, a ball, a doll, a transistor. On which... Julie Andrews sings. Now that your pullout is happening, you need to know what is going to happen in Kabul. And this, I believe, illustrates that scenario. The orchard in Kabul. Formed an orchard in Kabul. They said it was a lover's rendezvous. The heavens turned red with grief. The people came out of their homes in horror, their palms upturned to the sky. Just three words upon their lips, please, God, why? Some received a ruby of pomegranate in reply, and others an equal drop of lovers' blood from the sky. There were two pomegranate flowers upon the tree. She said, one is you, one is me. We left hers to ripen to fruit upon the tree. I carried mine into the battlefield. You won't believe the harvest it yield in the ambush against the militants. My rocket propelled grenade found a school bus of children instead. And it opened like a pomegranate. I shall carry the memory of that day and my flower to my grave. Children love fruit so much. And with my finger and my thumb, I pick up a purple plum. Upon the tree in summer heat, the purple plum turns very sweet. We get it from our friend, the fruit fellow. We buy the purple, but not the green and yellow. In my mouth, 
my tongue and pronounce the hello, hello. And this is um, a terror of the hunting lad gone to war. Interesting little story behind this, uh, this, behind this uh, poem. I hope you can hear me clearly. Can you hear me clearly? Indran, would you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me clearly? Yes, yeah. yes, I can hear you. Great. Um, I, I was in Philadelphia uh, in the early part of this millennium. And going into town Sunday morning to attend a poetry reading. Uh, the train was empty. A uh, gentleman got on and turned around in his seat and started staring at me. I ignored him. There was a war going on in Iraq and it was not a good time to stare back at people. But he kept staring at me and then he, I ignored him. He got up and came and sat down next to me. It's hard to ignore someone when they do that. He asked me, uh, would you be from Iraq? And I said, no, I'm from India. And he said, do you know any good prayers? So I thought to myself, this is not going in a good way. And I thought I would assert myself a little. So I stared back at him and I said, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a holy place, but not my place. My place is all farmers and soldiers. And I gave him a, a hard look. And he said, uh, but do you know any good prayers? So I turned to him and I said, excuse me, why are you asking me all these questions? He said, you're wearing a hunting jacket. You know, I'd received a jacket as a gift. I didn't carry enough warm clothing with me. And this was a flaming orange hunting jacket. I didn't realize it's not suitable for wearing into town on Sunday morning poetry. And he said, you're wearing a hunting jacket. My boy likes to hunt. And uh, I was hoping that you would, um, if you knew a good prayer, you'd say one for him because he's in Iraq now. Perhaps it might bring him back. And I told him I was a poet from a family of soldiers. I knew what it was like for his boy and I would write a poem for him. And I was at a poetry reading until he came back. This poem is called Terror of the Hunting Lad Gone to War. And I've dedicated this poem now to um, my uh, brother poet, Bill Nevins, uh, in honor of his son, um, Liam, who, who made the supreme sacrifice in, in Afghanistan. Terror of the hunting lad gone to war. There is terror when the long flight eastwards ends and a harsh hand of desert heat takes you by the throat and the ground crew of the plane carefully avoids your eye and the load master avoids your face. As a cargo of long boxes arrives to take your place for the long haul home. And the wind changes, bringing shining blue flies and a smell. You remember from last winter's hunting only too well when the freezer broke and the venison went through away bad. The same stench of rotting venison comes to you from the cargo of long boxes that has taken your place for the long haul home. And the plane leaves the stench behind, gently caressing your face. It says to you, hey, wake up. It's time to play the game, to defeat the stench of rotting venison in a desert that offers no forest, no trees, no deer, only an endless hunting. Uh, this is a little poem called An Elegy of Rice and Wheat. Uh, India fought for the freedom of a little nation called Bangladesh. And sadly today, they blame India for anything that goes wrong in their country. But that's also partly our own fault, because if you're a big brother, then be a good, strong big brother. So maybe she was here. And uh, this poem was written for, for Bangladesh. You have a beautiful field of rice there, a Bangladeshi. I love how evenly it spreads in every direction, promising rich harvests. 
except for those patches here and there, where the rice grows taller than the rest, almost like wheat. I am of the wheat people, you know. And my brothers too fought for your freedom and some were left behind. Write me a postcard if ever you find where they fell or even if you ever learn to tell. Why some patches of your perfectly even rice field grow taller than the rest, almost like wheat. How am I doing on time, uh, really? Billy, how am I doing on time? Um, I think you're doing fine, Amit. Um, because we uh, missed some other poets, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't write down your exact time you started, but I think you have another, another five or ten minutes. Go ahead. Great. So this is a prayer for the war against terror. If the concept of war survives this war. If the concept of God survives this war, then hear this prayer, O Lord. Your believers have put women and children to the sword. Must I too put down this pen and pick up a stone upon which to sharpen the steel nib so it cuts through blood and bone and the throat that utters poetry? Um, I made a transition from my village to the city to become a city person in my own lifetime. And um, this is where the poetry starts getting personal because a great Indian poet called Nida Fazli, who passed away two years ago, said to me that, Amit, if the poetry does not come from your own experience, A, it's not yours, and B, it's not poetry, whatever that means. But I made this transition, and this poem is called Transition. It's one of my earliest poems. Farewell fields of diamond dew and saffron morning light and deep wet earth that sucks and holds as frozen birds take flight. Now one farewell to all the love that milks the cows to froth and stirs the blood and strokes the flame till work and love are brought. A last farewell to the things I knew and the things I don't know yet. Words fade to nothing as the cows come home and soft dust sunset. So I made this transition to Delhi and that's what my next poem is called, Delhi. Where every twisting, turning, winding lane tells growing tales of mystery. Where every twisting, turning, winding lane tells growing tales of mystery. Where any piece of fallen stone could be a piece of broken history. Where empires forged in blood and steel have stayed as saffron scent on kitchen air, where the paradox is everywhere, of an imperial city with the flavors of a village, where a pavement dweller dares to tell you what your life holds and his caged parrot picks your chances, where a street urchin steals only the tune from your car stereo and dances. Where there is shade enough for shadeful glances. Where a true love still waits to be found. With just four lines of good poetry. Delhi. You know, when you come from my state, Haryana, which is a very high productive state of farmers and soldiers, one of the strange things you see in Delhi is this phenomenon called begging. Now people asking for money because they're they're broke. And I attended a art exhibition where there was a picture of five Buddhist monks with palms open and you know uh, like this ahead of them, uh, walking a straight line asking for arms. And there was some tourists standing there, and one of them says to the others. Um, this entire fucking culture is based on begging. 
uh, I used to be an angry young man once. And then I got wise and I learned something. Anger is a black crystalline stuff. And if you're smart, what you do is take your anger home. Crush it. If you genuinely feel bad about something, shed a tear or two in it. Mix it up into an ink. And write a poem. And sell the poem. That's what you need to do with anger, if you're a poet. And uh, so I wrote this poem called Bhiksha, which explores the concept of asking for alms or begging, especially in Buddhism. A monk, if he's hungry five times a day, goes out five times begging one handful of food each time in one school of Buddhism. And the reason is that each time you, you beg, you surrender some ego. And it's only when you've surrendered all your ego that the journey towards being a Buddhist can even begin. So the poem is called Bhiksha, which is the Buddhist word for begging from Sanskrit. I do not become a beggar when I invite you to open the greenery of your heart. I do not become a beggar when I invite you to open the granary of your heart. You do not become a giver and I am no taker when a small handful of food changes hands. Instead, when your fingers curl into a small cup of giving and my hand falls into a large bowl of receiving, we form a yantra of sacred sharing, a perfect mudra of two imperfect parts. When a single rice grain performs that long journey between us, it ends the famine between our souls, these empty, aching, and hungry hearts. In Delhi, you'll see something else. You will see uh, this beautiful language called Urdu, which, to my mind, uh, along with Spanish and Portuguese and English, one of the greatest languages for poetry and extremely elegant and flowery and decorous and sweet and courtly. It uses the script from Arabic, but Urdu itself has little to do with Arabic and has, apart from the script, it has more to do with a blend of Persian and Hindi. And this, this, this wonderful script is everywhere on monuments, it's on hoardings and signs and books and so the poem is called The Script of Urdu. Night stars impaled on black buck horns. Night stars impaled on black buck horns. The crescent curve of moon, sand dune. The sharpness of acacia thorns. Of these, the script of Urdu born. Oh, how the marsh reed celebrates every drop of wetness in the ink. Long flowing strokes and hesitates to contemplate and pause to think. They say that wisdom is the journey's wage upon the ivory prayer bead trail of vanished herds. They say that wisdom is the journey's wage upon the ivory prayer bead trail of vanished herds. The pen caravans across the desert page, bearing the fruit and shade of chosen words. I've gone through a lot of uh, poetry so far, but with so many beautiful people in, in the Zoom, I have to do a love poem. Uh, there's, there's no way I cannot. I must, I must. And this is called Love on a Lake in Kashmir. What, you ask, as my thirsty mouth draws water at the well of your throat? What you ask, as my thirsty mouth draws water at the well of your throat? My body joins your body. We turn into a boat, laden deep with soft, sweet words that flutter beneath your skin like startled birds. Their movement rocks our entity. And as our life drifts from worse to worse, you get the rice grains of memory 
I get the fragments of the universe. And uh, <laughs> thank you. I want to do a poem for you in my language Hindi, because um, you know you you earned the privilege of tasting tasting my tongue with your patience. I do not believe that the words on paper are the poem. I believe that the poem manifests itself between a throat that is trembling with a secret or sacred truth and an ear that is aching with thirst for that truth. The resonance between that ear and throat is the poem, is poetry. And uh, this is uh, my poem to the tiger, uh, a creature that I, I love dearly. I've been involved with tigers all my life since I was a child. My parents are both freedom fighters. And my friends believe that um, there should be a law against two freedom fighters marrying each other, because then this is what you get, you know, one uh, maverick poet. The, I'll, I'll do the poem in, in Hindi, and then there's an English uh, version for you. Suna hai koi shir Kuzarta hai yahan se Suna hai koi shir Kuzarta hai yahan se Ki paani pe hiran Khade hain piyase Sandhya ke anhad mein कोई पत्ता बोला है तो आंखों के तराजू ने हिरनों को तोला है शेर और हिरन की तकदीरें मिली हैं शेर और हिरन की तकदीरें मिली हैं कि दोनों को गुत कर कुदरत ने लिखी हैं संध्या का केसर अमावस्य का काजल शेर की शायरी करे जंगल को पागल हवन कुंड आँखों में मृगनैन पाए दर्पण हवन कुंड आँखों में मृगनैन पाए दर्पण अपनी ही आहुति का ब्रह्मांड में समर्पण हिरण की कुर्बानी पे शेर कुर्बान हिरण की कुर्बानी पे शेर कुर्बान इस भयानक सुंदरता की जय हो भगवान सुना है कोई शेर गुजरता है यहाँ से कि पानी पे हिरण खड़े हैं Yes. And finally, because it's uh, International Tigers Day, I'm going to end this with a poem, which has pretty well much become a signature poem. It's called The Last Will of the Tiger. The Last Will and Testament of Tiger. It was used by an Indian ch channel to raise more than three quarters of a million dollars to help save the tiger. I'm really uh, happy to report to you that uh, since the event started of Save the Tiger Telethon on television, uh, the population of tigers in India has doubled. And this poem is called The Last Will and Testament of the Tiger. And I'd like to conclude with this. You have stolen my skin from my entity and removed the roar from my life. O oh, hunter, wield the skinning knife with some grace, a little skill. For I too have hunted and killed many, many, many times, but every kill was a prayer and praise of the Creator. My movements were always quick, clean, merciful such is the way of true believers. But do you now hunt us, lie, slash, and cut clean? 
I pray only that you leave no part of me behind to be eaten by the jackal and the hyena. For I have ruled this forest on behalf of the creator himself. And there is no honor in a king becoming carrion. So take the sacred color from my coat, send it back to the maker of sunsets. So take the sacred color from my coat, send it back to the maker of sunsets. Take the darkness of my stripe and return it to the shadow and the undergrowth, for that is where it was obtained. Take the white of the fur of my belly and send it back to a new ice age that it returned to avenge me. Send my roar back to my maker, that he fill the heavens with my rage at this shabby end for a true king ordained by God himself. Send my claws to the young of the rich and the highborn to save them from their own nightmares. Send my teeth to Tibet that their aspirations for freedom find new teeth. Send my bones to China that they find the cure for the fear that builds such great walls. Send my fat to Singapore that they learn to make a bomb that is mine, not merely a name. Send my shit to the alchemists, for that is the only substance they have not yet tried in their efforts to invent gold. Give my entrails to whoever shall have them. But hang on to my eyes, you puny murderer. That your tribe might know that you did not fell a creature beneath you. That I looked you in the eye and did not flinch when you shot me. Instead, I am turned away, released from the cancer of your footprint. Let's all unmute and applaud Amit. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amit. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Amit. <laughs> so let's let's take the next uh, let's take the next uh, five to ten minutes just chatting with Amit. You can ask him questions. You can. Say what you like to say. <laughs> We're used to getting small doses of, of Amit uh, at open mics, but wow. <laughs> it's yeah. right. Amit, Amit, Amit I'm, I'm a little cloudy. Now, your parents were from exactly where? Um, my mother's family were refugees from Pakistan when Pakistan was created. Uh, my father's family are from a state called Haryana, which is on three sides of Delhi. Uh, I come from a community called the Jats, J-A-T. Um, uh, we think that Jats stands for justice, action, and truth, uh, because we have only two professions, farming and soldiering, and one, <laughs> and one word in the English language. <laughs> uh, someone mentioned, mentioned Tamil. In, in the no, chat, my my my, we think that the word jot stands for justice, action, and truth. But if you come to Delhi, which is just a hundred kilometers away uh, from my village, uh, they say it stands for just avoid them. Uh, <laughs> it it took me almost seven years, uh, no. <laughs> seven years to get a poetry reading in Delhi. You know, I mean, people would I mean, be laughing I and saying, "Oh." Let, let, let me just explain the tiger from Sri Lanka. The tigers were the Tamil tigers uh, who right fought thought, yeah. for a, a war of liberation for against the Sri Lankan government, and that's Gee. what. Uh, that's what I, I thought I was. I thought I was. My, my memory was worse than it is because I thought no, they no, came no, no, from no. from the island from an island off of India. Yeah. I, my, my, no, my, I didn't think they were from Pakistan or. Bangladesh were the I didn't think they were from the mainland. That's Actual no, living no. tigers you find in India. Uh, <laughs> tigers, symbolic tigers you still find in in, in uh, the island down south. Yeah. Sadly, more tigers were killed in Sri Lanka during the War of Liberation than have been killed in India mm. uh, in recent times. Um, it was a one terrible, terrible tragedy. Hi, Marianne. 
<laughs> Hello, who's the young lady? Aren't you going to introduce us? Uh, oh, this is my granddaughter, Aubrey. Hi. Hi. Hi, Aubrey. Hi, Aubrey. <laughs> my name's Ahmed. How nice to meet you. Hi, Hello, Ahmed. Oh, hi. Hi, 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 Kate. How are you? Mm. Oh, it's so wonderful to hear you. And I, I must share something. There was a time when Cultivating Voices had 10 minutes for 10 poets. Uh -huh. And I was a, a Nubian, an, an, a new writer of poetry, but always um, I've always lived poetry, whether climbing a tree or on a swing or being in love. But there I was, and I looked at the list, and I was assigned. First, it was Amit, and then it was Kate Clare, and then it was Indron. And I said, oh, no, how could I be in between these two men, these two scholars, <laughs> these, these two people? Um, and, and then, as the year has gone on, Amit and Indron are my teachers and I love them. And they sing in languages that I don't know, but I listen to the poets read them around the world and then they translate. And the translation in English gives me the word, <laughs> but when I hear it from the poets that they are representing, it gives me so much more from my brothers, Amit, and Thank, Thank you. you. But, you know, Kate, I agree with everything. Only thing is, you need to uh, rephrase that as uh, Indran and Amit because his scholarship uh, is is so extraordinary; it far exceeds any claim to scholarship I'll have in my life. Okay, I will be I will be corrected on that. But the order that we were put on cultivating voices <laughs> yeah, was you, know, me, I and know. Indron. And now Indron doesn't send me messages at two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just have to start, Kate. I'll have to start. Okay, <laughs> we can handle we can handle these lessons because uh, in, yeah. there's a lovely uh, guzzle, Urdu guzzle in in India. It says. Baat niklegi to dur talak Okay. And if uh, if um, if uh, if the fact comes out uh, between you know the fact of a relationship comes out, it will go a long way. <laughs> it will travel everywhere. Lovely. Now we all know. Now mm -hmm. we all know. But it's it's so beautiful. I have to hum. I have to hum two lines for you to. Baat nikle ki to phir dur talak jayegi log bevajah udasi ka sabab puchhenge aur bhi puchhenge tum pareshan kyun ho wah <laughs> You know, you know that if 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 the the truth about our relationship comes out, it, it will go so far, and people will ask you, you know, why is your hair so dry, so unoiled? You know, uh, you will have to practice and learn to ignore what they say because people can be cruel between two lovers. It's a, it's a beautiful ghazal. It was sung by Jagjit Singh, who died recently. And he was a good friend and, and a wonderfully gifted uh, singer. Beautiful song. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believed always, you know, uh, everybody, that that uh, we all need as poets to write some poetry that can be sung, to be written in a cadence that can be mm -hmm. sung, because the poems that can be sung will outlive us by thousands of years if they are any good. Mm -hmm. The ones that are prosaic will probably be used to cremate or bury us. <laughs> but the, the songs, they will they will outlive us for thousands of years if they're any good. And that's why I started writing songs, in fact. Mm -hmm. I've written quite a few poems that can be sung. Um, and Indran will, I think, appreciate this 
joke. Uh, you know, uh, in Haryana, we all call Thing. Thing means lion. And there are lots of people called Thing in Sri Lanka as well. But um, it's not because we're brave on the battlefield. I think we're called Thing because none of us can sing. We're all tone deaf. <laughs> but, but when we're happy, when we're happy, like I'm at this moment, you know, Oh, good. <laughs> um, we 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 love to sing, and that takes courage to know you can't sing, but because you're in the company of really beautiful people, uh, you feel like singing, so you sing. It doesn't matter if you can't sing. Uh, it's 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 your your love for your friends and your family and people that makes you sing. So, I mean, I'll, keep singing, and that what a show <laughs> you've given us, and what a kind oh, of generous, you, generous you, reading. You, you know, I, it's, it's my good. first time I'm hearing a good number of your poems together, you know, and it's just it's a treat, it's a treat. Thank you, and you're reading out literally out of the the brush there, the green tall grass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I I didn't want to spook people with my with my medical paraphernalia. Because I need to keep <laughs> puffing oxygen in between, and I've got all kinds of things around me, oxygen, okay. and I I thought it would totally taint the. Yeah, no, that's fine. Found this on on Zoom, and I said, "Oh, this is a lifesaver." Uh, so uh, I hold the phone with one hand, which makes it a little bit difficult to read properly and stay in the screen at the same time. Uh, so I just focus on the reading and forget about the screen time. Great, thank you. I would like to uh, I would like to butt in now and thank Amit one more time. Lots of applause for Amit. And I want to ask if uh, any of uh, Bill's guests are here: Jack Hirschman, Adrian Rice, Marcial Delgado, or Manuel Gonzalez. Are any of those? No, uh, I don't think so. And. Uh... Adrian had a, has not been able to get through the Zoom maze, unfortunately. He sends his apologies. So. Okay. So, he gave Billy, us Billy, Billy, we should auction their slots. Billy, you should auction their slots. I'm sure we're all hungry to read in COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy a few. <laughs> Even with your own money. That, that's all funny. Right. So I want to also ask if Brendan Bonsack is here. I didn't see him, but if he's here, then Amit wanted him to read. Yeah, he's he's incredible. I mean, you have to, uh, must, must uh, listen to Brendan Bonsack. He's not just a poet, he's a great musician. He is an incredible host. I'm trying to see the list of participants. I can, I can bring it up. But apparently he's not with us. And then Kathal, uh, did he send you a poem to read? Um, no, he's there. I, I can see his name on the on the list. That's okay, so go ahead and introduce uh, Kathal, Kathal, Brendan, or sorry, uh, Amit. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that I've discovered uh, after coming on to Zoom. Because I only came on to Zoom after uh, I met Bill, uh, Bill Nevins online. Uh, Bill is really, I mean, if anyone wants their money back, you have to catch Bill because he's responsible for my for my presence in in uh, in New Mexico and on Zoom. I'd never Zoomed before this, and uh, so everyone take a good look at Bill. That's the guy. Uh, get him before the bears and the elk do. Uh, I'm certain that there were no elk out today, other, otherwise we'd never have, you know, got a glimpse of him. Um, I don't think I don't think Katal is able to. Uh, I, I, I just saw a message from him on chat. That's why I unmuted myself. That's, Bernardo, did you get a poem? Yes, we... yes, yes, I did. That's why I unmuted myself because I wanted to tell you that I had his poem. Go ahead. Oh, fantastic, Bernardo. Go ahead. Okay. The name of the poem is I Give Praise to Our Meat. I give praise to our meat, a great poet without equal. He's Indian to the core. 
He is the champion of the tiger. He is a diligent, strong, brave man, always loyal to his friends. Like the river Ganges, which flows endlessly towards the Indian Ocean, he has his own river of creation coursing within his own heart to compose more new poems. His poetry will live on for a long time, as long as there are great poets. Therefore, success, my brother in poetry. K Hall. Thank you, Fernando. All right, then um, I do think it is time to turn the microphone over to Sandy Yanone to read a poem and introduce her guests. Take it away, Sandy. And can, can everyone mute if you're not muted? Thank you so much, Billy. And of course, Amit, what a, you know, what a thrill it is to be here with you. I want to, before I read my poem, I just want to share with you all that the first time um, we met online was on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Um, Amit and I had exchanged, he had sent me a few messages and asked how to get involved. And we were getting ready for our very last program of 2020. It was December 20th and it was our holiday poetry open house. And it was really a celebration of the whole year. And Amit mean, had, never, had never come to uh, Cultivating Voices at, by that time. But from the first moment, he opened his mouth and shared that, that sonorous, sonorous voice. Um, we knew, I knew in that moment that um, he had brought something so special to that gathering. And he was first up because he was reading from India. And I believe that all the folks reading tonight um, with me, and thank you for being here tonight, um, were, there that, were there that very uh, afternoon, evening, wherever you were joining us from. So it's a real pleasure for me to be able to uh, bring folks back to share their appreciation and love and support for you. You know, I wanted to also say that uh, Amit never ceases for me to connect through poetry, as you all know, and I look for his postings daily on Cultivating Voices live poetry in the same way that I look for the sun to rise. I mean, that's how significant uh, his work resonates with me. And today, of course, is International Tiger Day. And we were so fortunate to hear the last will and testament of the tiger on Cultivating Voices live poetry a couple of times. It felt only appropriate that um, the poem that I'm gonna share today isn't one of my own, um, but how could I not share with you for the poet that I think of as the tiger and who also wrote a beautiful poem for me when my, when my beloved Bosco passed away in May. Our connection through the feline is very strong. I'm gonna read for you all tonight, William Blake's Tiger, the Tiger in honor of Amit. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire 
of thine eyes, on what wings dare he aspire, what the hand dare seize the fire, and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart, and when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet, what the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain, what the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp, when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? I love the tiger. Thank you so much, Amit. And thank you for all that you have brought to Cultivating Voices live poetry. And now it is my great um, pleasure to introduce um, to introduce six poets who also um, are here to, to uh, honor you this evening. And first joining us, another poet who always brings the soul to his readers and to his readings. The rituals of poetry live on through Fergus Hogan, the candles flame and its incredible light joining us tonight from Water for Ireland, the author of The Bitter and Cry, Fergus Hogan. Uh, hello, friends. Um, Di Vakarja Galer, uh, Anukt, Tafalcheriv Vasjak's uh, bedroom tonight. Hello, friends across the world. You're welcome into the bedroom tonight. I think most of us met through this lockdown and through the Zoom, through sisters like Sandy and Kate and brothers like Idran and Amit. Amit, we honour you tonight and thank you for gathering us all together again. I obviously wanted to write and read a poem tonight for you, Amit, brother. Um, I also wanted to try and honour the nurses and the doctors and the carers over this lockdown. Um, who've minded us so well. I think, I think like everywhere else, the nurses in Ireland are poorly paid. They're unthanked. Uh, generally, it's women doing hard work in a job that has a very poor union. Um, and in Ireland, I think like a lot of other countries, the, um, a lot of the nurses come to Ireland from what might be called developing countries and they send what they can home to their families and their children. And it's really impossible for them to bring their partners, their lovers and their children to Ireland. Uh, the visas are hard to get. The accommodation is too expensive and COVID hasn't helped at all. Uh, but you know all of that. I think it's the same across the world. Uh, Amit, we don't have any tigers in Ireland. If we did, I would give them all to you tonight, brother. We have, uh, in our home, two small Bichon dogs. Bichon dogs, I think you'll know, are small, white, fluffy dogs. And I've squeezed one of them into this poem. And they say you should be very careful about the animals you bring into your poems or the pets you bring into your home because you can end up looking like your dog uh, all too soon. Now, this poem tonight is a love poem, Amit. I'm tempted to sing it to you, brother. Uh, it's for Amit and the nurse. Sitting in the Sunday garden after a day digging worms with the robin. I rest my eyes a while in the deck chair, listening. I wonder about our, how our world works now, the take and give from there to here, the sin of greed, the pity 
of charity. Trapped deep within cocoons of shallowed breathing, our lives on earth return to ground zero. I consider how COVID-19 has followed trade routes of commerce, killing the old, the weak, the vulnerable, just like toxic capitalism. The small white Bichon dog by my side eats scutch grass and vomits it back up green, bringing me back into the garden suddenly again. Here and now, a bumblebee lifts itself slow and heavy to the lip of a tulip. I think of the nurse. Nurse, nurse. I have a cough and a rash and night sweats and a shortness of breath. I'm 50 years old and I'm afraid to tell the doctor in case she sends me for the test. Ten years ago, I, sent, I spent two months in hospital with streptococcal pneumonia. The nurses said at the time I could have died. But when I got constipated, they said I was too young a man to be given the stuff they give to the older guys to sort them out. Instead, a young nurse from Thailand showed me a trick that her grandmother had given to her. You pinch your chin like this, she said. And the way she said it, she made me laugh out loud. And so for days and days and nights on end, I sat up straight in my bed, pinching my chin. And every night, the time the nurse from Thailand passed on or off duty by my bed, we laughed out loud together. And I still don't know if she was pulling my leg or having me on or just trying to help me relax. She said, my grandma Ya is the best natural herbalist or acupuncturist in the whole village back home. And I thought of her every day of this lockdown. Her warm smile and her caring broken English. And how she cried the morning she told me in a whisper, how she missed her granny so much. How she worried that when our Nana dies, she won't be able to afford to go back home. She's still repaying the debts her parents took on for her medical education. She's still repaying the cost of her flights to Ireland, her visa, her nursing registration, her cramped accommodation in the city. The last of the heat from the first summer day slips down behind the neighbor's hedge. Daffodils turn, cup the dying light. This night we gather in want of a good prayer. Instead, we offer our poems for our brother Amit. Gromagat, Akarja, the Gro. Well, friends, as I said, Fergus always brings the candle and the light. And uh, I always have so much to say, but I, I need, I, I know tonight I'm not able to be my usual <laughs> uh, loquacious self. So I will keep the program moving further. Slantia, Fergus, and thank you. Well, on Cultivating Voices, uh, again, on that day, um, we had another on December. We've been so blessed to have so many melodious poets join us with, 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 with all like their full throat and full hearts and languages and that is so true of this next poet joining us tonight, um, who is now also, as with Fergus, my, my dear friend, Josephine Lore. And Josephine, 
is you've seen many times if you've been on Cultivating Voice, she's a fantastic teacher, translator, and of course, human being, um, and author of the Cowichan series. Joining us tonight from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thank you so much, Josephine. Thank you. It's such an honor to be in this company and I'm, I'm finding there's folks from different circles that I have read with and heard reading. Um, I will try my best to, uh, in my tribute to Amit and in uh, recognition of how we as poets have been responding to um, to COVID. The first poem was that I'm reading was actually the first COVID poem that I wrote. Um, and I was watching the news and um, there were army trucks in Italy with body bags. And, and then here in Calgary, um, I woke up one morning and the, they had strung police tape at the children's playgrounds. So this one is called Six Feet. Police tape on the stairs of slides, on swings, a cortege of army trucks, each filled with the dead, bodies in black bags, no bedside deaths, no funerals, no gatherings, no weddings, no Sunday dinners with grandma and grandpa, no hugs, six feet is the minimum distance feeling buried, standing up. Outside, flickers, magpies, squirrels, hairs turning slowly brown, ice melting, days lengthening. And the only music that fits is the dirge. And at the playground, there is police tape, empty slides, empty swings. The second piece I'd like to share, um, I wrote in honor of my father. Uh, my family's from Sicily, and it's a little bit of a story of, of, um, of my father and my family. Tools. My father, too, used tools. Young, he apprenticed to a shoemaker because only the father and the eldest could work the sulfur mine, and he was the second. The third, really, the second having died before my father was born. My father was given his dead brother's name. I have the wooden forms in my closet, black extendable Geppetto feet on which to fit the leather to cobble shoes. But shoemaking was not in my father's destiny. He traveled to England first, learned how to say aluminium so you could hear the final I. When I was a child, people asked why I spoke with a British accent. Then to Belgium to work the mines, but there was a collapse, a tragedy at Charleroi. 262 migrants trapped, killed, many of them Italian. And my mother, seed of their first child in her belly, pleaded with my father to leave. From Le Havre, they crossed the Atlantic on La Flandre, like those who had fled the potato famine. And that time the British took land from the Scots for sheep pasture, the dispossessed, the displaced. In Canada, my father worked many jobs, an unskilled man with little language, sorry, with little knowledge of a language and even less of the laws. He ended up a carpenter like the father of Christ smelled of sawdust, hands rough, but never raised. Behind his ear, a pencil, not round, but flattened. It did not fit the sharpener, so he used a knife to create a chiseled edge while I watched. Nails and loose change in his pockets, his shoulders broad as his smile. He built things, fixed things, measured things, and having no sons, he worked alone while we sisters learned to cook and clean, to pray the rosary and darn, embroider flowers and birds in silken colors, to be obedient, well-mannered above all. I would slink off to the garage to help my father by passing him the tools. I learned all their names. Lo Martedro, the hammer. La Raspa, the file. La Giravete, the screwdriver. 
la sega, la pinza, la chiave inglese, the wrench, whose words literally mean the English key. And that one whose syllables elude me, the planer, that smooth wood creating curlicues out of a tree. Oh, and that little silver heart-shaped box which fits the palm, its powder magic blue to mark a plumb line. I would slink to the garage, avoid the cloister of the house as willingly as I would slink into a book. What are my tools now? Computer, like the coiled cord of a phone that stretches across this continent and beyond to connect family, we all under house arrest. The charge? The charge to remain healthy, to avoid the symptomatic, the asymptomatic, my tools, memory and language, my tools. And the third piece I've written for Amit, and um, I was reading some of Amit's writings that are posted and I, I was captured by this line, we hang by a lifeline of breath and the line is thin. And I was thinking of the breath of how we enter into this universe and the first action is the intake of breath inflating the lungs and our final exit passage out of this world is the emptying of the lungs um, and what you said tonight Amit between the throat and the ear I believe the poem is the breath this poem is called living air I go to the forest to breathe in the green cedar to walk among the hemlock and the spruce but the globe so swiftly warming, the woodlands a combustion, and instead of living oxygen, I breathe in smoke and ash. So I go to the ocean to inhale the misty salt spray, kelp strewn at low tide's edge, but the seashore a miasma of plastic desecration, and instead of living oxygen, I breathe in stink and waste. I go to Holy Mountain, the very peak of heaven, to breathe in pristine crystals of pure celestial air. But her pathways are congested with miles of human traffic. And instead of living oxygen, I breathe in the taint of ego and despair. So I go to the city to seek some quiet wisdom from the learned scholars there. Instead, I find contagion, the ravage of pandemic, my lungs slowly starving for that breath of living air. Thank you very much. Grazie, 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 Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we move from living, the idea of living air I think about that the word inspire, you know, literally means also to, to breathe, right? To inspire. Um, thank you for that reading that of course did just that, um, as does Amit's work to, for all of us has inspired this gathering so far. Well, our next, poet um, from every, from the first utterance that I've, the first utterance to every single utterance of Angela Driven's poetry has just awed and inspired me, as well as many of you here this evening and again, I, I hearken back to that evening on December 20th, where very few of you that were in the, that were with us on Zoom that night will ever forget our reading her praise poem. Angela Driven's debut collection is Every Girl from Main Street Rag. Please welcome Angela Driven. Hi. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I mean, this, uh, this poem was written directly to you um, from my throat to your ears. May there be some resonance. To the poet 
the bard, the seer. This poem is for this poet rooted into the earth, crying to the sky, scribing from the borrowed thread of energy that unites us all. To the poet who sees translucent trails of the leaf miner plaiting lace of locust leaves. To the poet who witnesses the beetle's excavation through the inner tissues of the leaf, a protected life in narrow space. To the poet who comprehends the complexity of the second generation of adult beetles drinking life that is not theirs until the entire locust tree turns brown. To the poet who strains his neck to see if this is glorious redesign. Is it our emerald ash borer, gypsy moth, Dutch elm disease, or the chestnut blight? To this poet who climbs the tree to see the tree. To the poet who questions the biologist when they ask, when they say black locust trees are not truly a species of the forest. They grow in reverting fields and in edge habitats, such as along roadsides. To this poet nursing 19 languages on their tongue, who knows to ask what sounds we make when we chant forest. If it is a large area covered chiefly with trees and undergrowth, then can't a roadside still be a forest? To the poet who balks when the tourist name the mind browning locust ugly. To the poet who names the locust, resilience, strength, radiance, as it sustains its own life and surfaces again each spring, taller, broader, greened again. To the poet who asks the locust if it fears us, when we bow up on the fox grape vines, relentlessly wrench their knots from its stressing branches, wreath them around themselves till they can't get loose, calling ourselves savior, hero, humanitarian. To the poet who knows, we should have asked the locust if it ever even wanted the light. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Angela Triven, for as you as you are wont to do, bringing the sustenance through the light tonight in our reading. Uh, thanks uh, with gratitude. Well, next, Carolyn Wright joins us from. Seattle and really the title poem to from her latest book this dream the world new and selected poems really begged me to think about um, you know her body of work and the way that she honors poets and poetry through that 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 lens of the multilingual as a translator and as a humanitarian. So would you please join me in welcoming Carolyn Wright. Thank you so much, Sandy and Billy and everybody gathered here. Um, and thank you, Amit, for your powerful work <clears throat> and for your life there. Uh, as a, a farmer and not a soldier. And, uh, you know, it's such an honor to be part of this gathering here uh, to read poetry and to <clears throat> breathe that inspiration into uh, all of our lives. What I'm going to do, I just switched entirely what I was going to do. Um, but I thought what I would do uh, 
in honor of the, the part of the world in which you are living, uh, Amit, is to read one of my translations from Bengali of the poet Nobonita Dev Sen, who uh, left us. She did her gong, her journey to the Ganga, uh, her Ganga Jatra in 2019, uh, when she passed away. And she was a poet I worked with quite, quite uh, a great deal when I was there in Kolkata. And I would go to her house and there's a whole story to write about that. But I'm going to read a poem of hers called Story of the Forest, or in Bengali, it's Aronok. Uh, and this is my translation. She's also done her own translation, uh, but this is just called Story of the Forest. And you'll see why I chose it. Mother, my exile in the forest is ended now. Mother, underneath this matted hair and beard, recognize my adolescent's face, recognize your nursing child. Mother, bare your breasts and see whether the seven streams of nectared milk gush towards my open mouth. Look, mother, the feet on which your golden anklets jingle, how torn and wounded by thorns, how scarred and roughened that arm where you had tied your amulet chanting a prayer at the time of my birth. Mother, look, my breast where your hand planted this sapling of a heart in a green expanse of grass. There in the dark mesh of this hidden forest, impenetrable, on carnivorous branches now, fanged leaves, all devouring entangled tongues. How it has grown like a tiger, that tree gnawing the hearts of others. Mother, my exile in the forest is ended now. Now the forest dwells in me. And uh, there's a whole story uh, behind that poem. I translated it with the uh, help of a wonderful gentleman named Sunil B. Roy, uh, who lived near me in South Calcutta. Uh, and I'm gonna read one more poem of my own, which also deals with a sort of a journey, uh, not, not back from the forest, but going out into a, uh, a, 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 a place beyond. And it's called The Discipline of Becoming Invisible. The discipline of becoming invisible is not what you think it is. Start by driving all night cross country, avoiding towns, travel light, take breath, words enough for a few poems, your clearest sight. Don't calculate the miles or wonder if you'll ever get to the point on the map where your road breaks off. You can't miss invisibility. It wears your face inside out. It stares back at you everywhere. It's on the signs at midnight glowing off the shoulder of the road. It's in the number of hours and the sleep it takes to drain a city out of you. It's in the light that fires your retinas with sight. When you arrive at the toll gate, where the road ends, you'll pay the last of yourself out as the roped nerves uncoil themselves from the base of your brain. Invisibility will be your change. You'll realize you've carried it all the way, like chromosomes or the life maps on your palms. Now, when you peer into the rear view mirror, only the road winds backward in the glass distance. As you slide away into the high clairvoyant blue of dusk, you'll wonder what sign it was 
in what unknown code at the road's edge first glowed in your sleep and pointed here where your breath lets go and your sight opens as it turns to light. Thank you and blessings to you, Amit. With Carolyn Wright, everybody, thank you for bringing the, the insight of that cross-cultural experience of translating from the Bengali and sharing that with us on this very, very special evening um, in honor and support of, of, of Amit and uh, just fantastic to hear always your poems. Thank you. Well, folks, our next two readers um, in my set, um, which boy, what a great reading this has been already tonight. Um, two people that, you know, Cultivating Voices couldn't do its work without them. And the first is Kim Ports Parsons. You know, you know, Kim is with us every week. And as a result of that, she has spent so much time with Amit and, um, and also having that privilege of being able to listen and learn and, and uh, be inspired and inspire her work um, through that experience. Well, Kim is joining us this evening from the beautiful, beautiful Shenandoah Valley with her lush gardens, as well as her lush, lush, deep poetry. Thank you for being with us tonight, Kim. Thank you so much, Sandy, and um, everyone. What a beautiful, beautiful reading. And Amit, it is such an honor to be your friend and sister in poetry and to make connections week after week through your words and your beautiful voice and your incredible spirit. And when I think of you, I think of the urge to embrace life to through poetry, to affirm life through poetry, to rise above um, the difficulties and bathe in the beauty of life through poetry. And I have written us a, a short sonnet, which I'm going to share, um, which I think uh, touches a, a little bit humbly on those themes. Thank you all for letting me participate tonight. It's really wonderful to be here. Life goals. To see the way a coneflower sees a carpenter bee vibrating with hunger and need. To need the way a stone requires rain, wind, time, and gravity's pull. To pull the way a birch pulls from its core without practice or instruction, bends to grass with grace, forgiving the wind's trespasses. To forgive and hold firm as the goldfinch on the thin swaying stalk of millet in March. To shine as the same finch when summer comes, flashing sun on broken glass, loop of golden air. To hear the way the mole hears through every hair, the next shining moment of the underground day, a lighthouse made of sound, life at the root. Blessings to you all, blessings to you, Amit. Thank you. How could we not have a reading without a sonnet and one of such uh, depth 
and specificity and connection of the human, the animal, the earth, and the spirit, all embodied in just those 14, not just, but those 14 lines of Kim Ports Parsons. Thank you, my dear sister, for being here tonight. Well, finally, um, for my fabulous group of poets, the roar of poets, as I've been calling them on Cultivating Voices page today, um, we welcome Don Krieger. You all know Don as the as two things. Um, he is he is the life breath of so many readings, um, supporting the many many platforms, including this very reading tonight. But it is Don's poetry that is always a higher, greater call for justice and humanity. And that is no better exemplified than in his current collection, Discovery. Would you please welcome our dear friend and tremendous anchor to so many, Don Krieger. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Kim. That was that was a good poem. Um, and everyone, I, actually, I sent one poem. My I sent my poem to Amit, but I'm going to read something else. I, I don't think I can read that one. <laughs> Sparrow generations. Brown offered a full ride on my tennis, MIT on academics. Even then, I knew. I want to learn in college. I have a choice. Chris Dolman, Tony Dorsett, Dan Marino, the lucky athletes who soared to glory. Their generations passed through Pitt Stadium right outside my office window. I marveled at the, as the Coliseum was demolished and one early morning at the end, when no one else was looking, the facade with the entrance gate fell. The last grand relic to come down broke the street and the sewer beneath. And I finally understood that choice I made at 16. Now it's an event center, the peat, glass and concrete, food mall and Wi Fi. Judas Priest and basketball, Foo Fighters, hockey, Disney on ice. Sometimes I ride up the escalator. Mostly I walk outdoors through the hedges, alive with birds, feral cats and groundhogs. Either way, you can't miss that vaulted interior, limitless ceiling video wall like the side of a house, sports news constantly running, pictures of trophied athletes displayed in locked cases like numbered Audubon prints or rare baseball cards. In the morning, I pass by the gym. Even at six, there are students on the treadmills, boys fit and massive beautiful, girls fit and beautiful too. I see them on campus with their teammates, lounging and laughing, bruised and braced, casts and crutches. Often a bird strikes the peak windows in flight, then lies still on the concrete till the janitor comes. Sometimes I carry one back to the hedges, when it's been days. Last week, I saw a sparrow by the glass wall, standing on the concrete like a statue, even when I knelt beside it. I touched his belly, urged him, step up. He hopped over my finger, then turned and flew onto my hand. 
the life and quickness in that tiny body, the bright trust of a stranger. I slowly stood and walked him up to the hedges, urged him once more, and he flew free on to his own life. Let's all unmute and thank the uh, Cultivating Voices live group. Tremendous, yeah. tremendous poetry. Yeah, yeah. Well Incredible. done. Incredible. Thanks, everybody. Fabulous, as always. Right. Yeah. Right. Like attending a master class. <laughs> <laughs> Learned so much today. My God. Thank you so much, Sandy, and all of your uh, cultivating voices. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we turn to John Roche and uh, his invited guests. Please take it away, John. Thank you, Billy, and uh, thanks, everybody. What a, what a great night for poetry, and especially to Amit, what an incredible reading. I'm, I'm still uh, recovering from that. So thank you, thank you. Um, I, I've got two tiny poems uh, to start with, and then I have some, some poets to introduce. And uh, the first is from uh, my earlier, uh, the first Joe book, Joe the Poet book. <clears throat> it's called Joe the Poet at the World Naval. Joe searches for his chosen spot place of emergence into his own joyous lake. 20 years, for 20 years he walks with forward striving toes, bony thighs and rain bespattered clothes to show for it. He gets detained by mundane matters for 20 more, sets out again renewed of purpose, but fearful lest he's tarried too long, hopes it's still there, hasn't been fracked or paved or blown up in the recent war. 20 more years gone, his steps grown shorter, his eyesight weaker. If he slows down just a tad more, he'll be right on top of it. And uh, the, the uh, next poem is from the survival volume we did in 2018, part of the Poet Speak series. And uh, it's by Martha Treichler. I just saw her on Zoom. She's 92 years old uh, and um, has produced something like eight volumes of poetry in the past decade and has another one on the way. And she's still farming too. Another farmer poet on it. Um, <clears throat> in, um, upstate New York. So this is uh, from Martha Treichler called Survival. It's the last uh, poem from the, from the book, sur uh, Survival. <clears throat> Survival is only the beginning. Life starts after that. When you say I survived, that is good, but not good enough. Survival is only the beginning. Then we must gather our tools and get to work. And uh, Ahmed is a working poet. And uh, I'm, we've just been amazed this, these, these past months, just how many poems. He seems to write two or three every day. It's amazing. And they're damn good poems. So thank you. Uh, all right. Um, so our uh, first up uh, from Albuquerque is Holly Wilson. And Holly. Uh, is a musician, a dancer, a performance poet who is very, very well known in uh, to Albuquerque audiences and New Mexico audiences. And uh, she also hosts the monthly Tortuga Gallery open mic, which has been on Zoom of late. I know Amit's been mm -hmm. on it and, and many of you, Sandy. And uh, I think it's also gonna be, I think it's gonna be hybrid uh, starting pretty soon uh, in person and Zoom. So Holly, would you unmute? Thank you, I'm here. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Actually, we're gonna do it in person at Tortuga and on Zoom the night before. So 
I'll be doing two readings. So we can still have our international uh, audience come in. Um, I picked this poem to read for Amit because um, he's brought such international, I don't know, universal energy into our poetry readings. And because of all the, the different people that are here tonight from different places. So this is for you, Amit, and thank you so much for your generous sharing of your words. It's been great getting to know you. It's called Free Zone. No borders, flags, or fences round my door. The world seeps in and flows back out like Jamaican water rising into air, becoming snow in Switzerland. I do not cease to exist as El Paso turns into Juarez, where imaginary halfway point divides river that has kept nobody out. I cannot differentiate Arabs and Jews, Hindus and Muslims. The mountain does not stop to draw a line to mark her lower ridge. Mountains and mountains flow into each other, flow into oceans and beaches around continuous circles. Wherever we go, we run into each other. We always come back to ourselves. Sharing one sphere in space, we can only see each other through open doors. The lights from our vibrations mingle and shine out to other planets. We are to them as islands scattered in an infinite archipelago. No barbed wire trenches block the universe from coming in. I go out as it comes to me. If we didn't put them up, there'd be no need for borders, flags, or fences. Thank you. And bless you, Amit, all the health and happiness in the world for you. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. An, an apt poem indeed. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, also from Albuquerque, is Sylvia, uh, well, these days, uh, Sylvia Ramos Cruz, a uh, retired surgeon living in Albuquerque whose photographs and award-winning prose and poetry appear in local national publications uh, and um, too many to mention. And right now she's been working on uh, a fascinating project of High Boon about uh, the historic women of New Mexico and also very involved with, with the, the history of the suffrage movement. So uh, Sylvia. Thank you very much, John. And thank you all for being here and sharing uh, poetry uh, with all of us. Uh, it's truly inspiring. I uh, want to thank you, especially Amit, for your poetry and your poetic voice. I really enjoyed the, especially the children's poems. We rarely, if ever, hear children's voices at any of our meetings. I don't mean having little children there, perhaps, but having poets not be afraid to hear, to, to read their, you know, their poems to children. I enjoy that very much. May you soon walk in the sunlight of good health and well-being. My poem is Deliverance. Tingley Coliseum, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 2021. The Coliseum, silent for a pandemic year, holds his first event, not a sports extravaganza, country music concert, or comedy club, a COVID-19 vaccination clinic. Arena lights are on, but the electronic scoreboards and clock remain asleep across from the announcer's glassed-in nest, hovering empty over the court. Flags for Coca-Cola, United Rentals, Document Solutions, Flea Market float near the upper reaches alongside the Stars and Stripes and New Mexico Zia, all trembling slightly in the breeze from the ramped up ventilation. 
Below, on the floor, all is ready. Yellow arrows in, blue arrows out, metal gates to keep lines in check, chairs spaced and sanitized. In fact, everything sanitized. Vaccination station tables topped with block, topped with boxes of blue latex free gloves, blood red sharps containers, rectangular bins brimming with vaccines laid side to side, top to bottom like ICBM missiles loaded on railway cars. And we, the troops, masked and vested in task colors, Expo Park, em Expo Park employees in neon yellow green, volunteers and health department team leaders in black, white supply runners, blue vaccinators, green scribes, yellow flow directors, red medical observers, all wearing our names over our hearts, ready. Then the main event, doors open, mass men and women, some in wheelchairs, some with a retinue of adults and children march in, dressed in casual or business clothes, hijabs, saris, and shorts, shot in Oxford's stiletto sneakers and boots. All wait quietly online, sit behind screens, expose tender arms for shots. File out, fold into chairs, for 15 or 30 minutes observations. Most look at phones, glance up once in a while. All of us observers and observed still timid after a year reminding ourselves and others not to get close. Some carry on quiet conversations. Others ask anxious questions about what to expect and is it really safe? At last, having received their deliverance in the form of your observation time is done, text from the state, look around to see if they are indeed free to go. Then get up, follow arrows to the exit, perhaps wave goodbye or say gracias, whispering as if leaving a place of prayer before stepping out into the sunlight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. That was a, that was a lovely chronicle and, and tribute uh, uh, to all the health workers and volunteers. Thank you so much. And uh, changing places here in the uh, in the green box <laughs> as is. Uh, our next reader, Jesse Ehrenberg, um, who is uh, the author of Surprise uh, from Foothills Publishing, uh, which won a silver award in the inaugural Margaret Randall Poetry Book Contest a couple of years ago. And uh, as I understand, Jesse has a second book about to be published as well. So Jesse, take it away. Unmute, please. Let's try that. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Amit, this is for you. I was thinking about Amit and it started me thinking about India and Indian poetry. And then I thought about America and American poetry. And I thought about where they both started. In America, we can trace our poetry back to the early 1600s, to the colonial first wave of European genocidal land, land grab that was to eventually become, in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, what we still call the United States. But I digress. So at most, that gives us a poetic history of about 400 years. Contrast that with India, whose poetry goes back 20 centuries to the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. I think that's why when you hear Ahmed read, 
beyond the beauty of his imagery and metaphor, beyond his passion for the oppressed, you hear the voice of history. It's in his cadence, that indecipherable place where words turn into music. It's in the very power of his poems. Now, I have to say, I know little of Ahmet beyond his poems and the artistry of his presentation. But sometimes a little is enough. Thank you, Ahmet. Thank you, Jesse. The voice of history, uh, great context there. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, is Debbie Brody here? Debbie Cap Brody, I don't see her. She's supposed to be the next reader, but I don't see her. Um, <clears throat> then we'll, we'll move on uh, to another Santa Fe poet, uh, Donald Levering and who is, uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, one of the most sought out poets uh, in New Mexico and has, uh, I think, something like 10 books out, uh, most recent ones, The Water Leveling With Us, Coltrane's God, Previous Lives, Any Song Will Do, and Horsetail that came out last year from, from Woodley Press. Uh, so would you please, Welcome, Donald Levering. Thank you, John. Um, I'm honored to be among uh, such a cast of readers here. I, I'll just read one poem. Um, it's called The Spring of Our Contagion. Moon wanes, the moon swells, old clothes don't fit my niece's growing abdomen. Even with her pregnant bloom, sometimes she slips into a cloak bloom. This spring of our contagion, we wear winter into May. People stand a coffin lengths apart. Their grins are masked. Everyone can don the cloak of bloom. Nightmares can come true. I dream of doorways blocked by coffins and someone coughing in my closet. The screen door of my neighbor's emptied house keeps slamming closed. The virus claimed his life. His door keeps slamming closed. I keep dreaming of blocked doorways and someone coughing in my closet. The virus claimed his life. Wars against the poor being ground. Jobs are slashed and the debts amass. Business is on life support, wars against the poor being ground. Yet this spring, the apricots have burst into bedazzlement of blooms, as if this were spring as usual with apricots bedazzlement. Just as in an ordinary spring, I hear the pulse of morning doves like tolling bells. The morning doves are calling each other as usual. Moon wanes, the moon swells like any other year. My niece grows luminous with child, her due date nears as if this were any other year. Uh, thank you, Donald. Uh, incredible, incredible poem about our times and uh, a coffin's length apart, yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> I guess they didn't think that part through. Yeah. Excuse me, everybody. Um, I have to go shortly. I have a lunch date. Um, Hi, Gordon. Would you like to hear a purely Australian poem before I go? Uh, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Billy a second, then, since he's running things. Uh, Gordon, Bill? go ahead. Go ahead with a short poem. Okay. Go ahead, Gordon. Okay. This one's called. Red ochre on white canvas. How do you paint a desert scene? Red ochre on white canvas. The most desolate place you've ever seen. Red ochre on white canvas. Easel set beside a rust red road. Red ochre on white canvas. 
a road train pulling a long heavy load. Red ochre on white canvas. Massive red bulk of Uluru. Red ochre on white canvas. Catajuca boulders of ochre hue. Red ochre on white canvas. Bungle bungles, domes and caves. Red ochre on white canvas. The artist paints the scenes to save. Red ochre on white canvas. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Back to you, John. I'll, I'll say goodbye to everybody. Armit, it's been great seeing you again. And I look forward to our next uh, next meeting. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks Bye. very Thank much, you, Gordon. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you again, Donald uh, and Gordon. Um, next up uh, from Placidas, uh, New Mexico, uh, uh, a few miles from, from where I am, uh, is Larry Goodell. And uh, Larry could rightfully be called the Bard of Placidas, having lived in the village since the early 1960s. Around that time, he started his celebrated Duende Press now archived at Yale University's Beinecke Library. Uh, Larry also helped pioneer the field of performance poetry, designing his own mask costumes and props, sometimes with the help of his artist spouse, Lenore. Uh, he took part in the legendary Taos Poetry Circus and emceed a number of readings over the over, reading series over the decades in, in, uh, in this area. And uh, Larry continues to publish his own books of poetry at an astounding rate. Uh, Larry Goodell, please unmute. You're still muted, Larry. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I'm sorry, I've been so sluggish about getting into the Zoom thing. And so, uh, Sorry, I haven't run into Ahmed before this. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it would read, this is for my book, Nothing to Laugh About. <clears throat> this is a poem I was asked to, to write and I wrote for, for John Roche and Jules Nyquist when they got married. It's called Arrival. And this, this has to do with movements of people. And now I've mentioned something about how he got where he is. So this also involves my family as well as John and Jules. Historic ether as the moon comes up and mesmerizes. The glimmer in the clouds is full burst. The old terms catch the tongue as well as the new as seen through the upheaval of the oral. Place takes up dance in the plaza. All lenses along the borders improve the light as stars will tell you late at night. As you come home anytime, the light lifts up to greet you, whirling in on the old 66 or I-25, I-10, 64, 60, 285, 54, 84 to I-40, or descending as the land gets closer and you bump down on it. You have arrived. The slightly expanded out square like a skirt in the strange toe to Sonora, the state will bring you to an illumination of its past as the voices of the Rio Grande, the Indian Rio Grande is in company with poverty as a starving drought will enter your soul as well as the vistas of gypsum and striking red, what sustains and turns into love is the honesty but this is what is what is. And along with this delight in the friendship of voice, the articulation of friends, the real ones, the real emergence as those who come here long before us, as my father's mother and father in a wagon from Kansas, as all of us, any way we can, arrive where we are, as they did in Grenville, in Artesia, and Roswell, as you did, Connecticut, New York, Minneapolis, and all, or truly emerging up from the ground and building the first empires here. Love finds love in happenstance, in chance, in mystery and change, as I celebrate my love, finding New York to New Mexico, and New Mexico already here, 
May you and you all see with brighter eyes and hear what comes to you to hear as true partnership is possible. Break through like the moon and shining stars and water when thought absent suddenly surprises as Las Huertas every day in mind and actuality greets me. Blessings and festival of the seasonal reverberates. History making new history, the story telling itself over and over in ever new ways is what you are beginning to tell. Love folds out in creaturehood and presents us with a map of understanding and your partnership. And very, very shortly, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and love to you, John and, and Jules. It's just Thank you. Great to hear that again after five years. <laughs> <laughs> Very shortly, what is the reason we're all here and not being hounded and oppressed and thrown in jail like so many of our brothers and sisters are? Free is speech. Breathing in the sky open, it is free space. As air is to speech, free speech as air is. So is speech, free to say, say and say and say forever the freedom to say. What you mean in your speech can be disparaging, can be enlightening, and cannot be prohibited, but free, free as the air you breathe, the speech of your tongue, the air in your lungs, the breath of the earth speaks freely to you and me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you. Um, I have one more poet to introduce. I see she's having some trouble with sound. Hopefully uh, that can be rectified. It's uh, Mina Chopra, a Toronto-based poet and visual artist who was born and raised in Northern India. Her book, Color and Radiance, is an anthology of Indian poets living in Canada. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, unmute uh, Nina if you can. Uh, Mina? Apparently her sound system is not working, her microphone. Mina, can you hear us? Put your thumb up if you can hear us. Hmm. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, sometimes if you, uh, sometimes if you, uh, get out and then come back in, sometimes it corrects itself. So you, that's the only thing I think I could suggest. Yes, Mina, uh, if you can hear us, go ahead and leave the session and then come back in and see if you are able to be heard at that point. Put your thumb up if you understand. She has her hand up. Really? Yes. This Lenora, she put in the chat that she could not hear. Okay. okay. So you might want to type it in to her to get out and come back. Okay, um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's my group. <laughs> and hopefully we'll have Mina back up uh, in a few minutes. Okay. Let me just type this message. Okay, uh, I just sent a message, but you can send oh, okay. it. Okay, okay, great. So I'll turn things back to Billy. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And uh, let's uh, take a moment to applaud all of uh, John's guests and John's poetry. Thank you. Uh, what, a, what a great set. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much.
All right, it is uh, my lot in life to go last, but <laughs> certainly not least. Hmm. Uh, I have a poem that I wrote today for Amit, which I would like to read. Uh, it occurred to me when I awoke this morning about 3 a.m. Uh, and was thinking of miracles and Amit. So Amit, this is for you. As I awaken early, my first thoughts are of miracles, miracles with Amit. Miracle of the internet, we can touch each other with our voices, our faces, our poetry via Facebook, via Zoom. The miracle, a new brother in poetry I did not know I had until this internet brought us together, simultaneous electrons sizzling between us. The miracle of rain, which fell on both of us this morning, a delicious simultaneous shower, blessing our brotherhood on opposite ends of the earth. The miracle of birth. We were both born the same year, just 44 years ago. Brothers from other mothers in separate wombs yet destined to be together. The miracle of sharing death, the deaths of our sweet beloved children in car crashes. We weep together in a worldwide rain. The miracle of COVID survival you, by your sheer miraculous determination to live and share poetry, and I, by the miracle of scientific innovation, the miracle of a vaccine, the miracle of love, our love for each other, Amit, and our love of poetry as the powerful, joyful, healing miracle of deep feelings expressed. Many miraculous blessings to you, Amit. I'll be with you, Anon, next year, together, in an embrace of miracles, my poetic brother. Thank you, Amit. And Billy, do you have a list of people that are reading yet since I have since nobody called my name yet? Yes, I have that list. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I wasn't sure if you were you didn't mention. <laughs> I'll, I'll read it quickly and then I'll go through each of you. Uh, first, we have Teresa Gallion, then Miriam Sagan, then Janet Ruth, then Vijali Hamilton, then Hakeem Bellamy, then Lou Similor, and then finally Zachary Kluckman. Uh, please welcome Teresa Gallion, author of four books, the most recent of which is entitled, and I love this title, Scent of Love. She describes herself as a seeker in a journey on unfolding spirituality in the present lifetime. Take it away, Teresa. I want to say blessings to dear Ahmet, and I wish you healing, light, and love. Take care. The poem I'm reading is a poem I wrote for the world, and it is appropriate for the world since we have this happening all over the world. It's called Pandemic Uglies. Mother stands on the top of the mountain, smiling and frowning. Even in the pandemic, some of the children dance with arrogance, ignorance, and inconsiderateness. Their karmic debt will eventually drown them. The ugly element of human shows its face with every crisis. The trolls, naysayers, blamers, money grabbers, scammers, all come out as the alternative virus. They do much harm, but cannot win. There's a reserve team, much more powerful. The army of humanity always comes to, though they may suffer much, nothing stops compassion's flood. Still, the question remains afloat. 
Will the human species learn to appreciate a new day? The planet belongs to no one and respect for mother earth is required. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Teresa. Next, uh, we have Miriam Sagan, a Santa Fe poet with at least 30 books to her credit. And um, before her retirement, she founded and directed the creative writing program at Santa Fe Community College. And this is, uh, this is <clears throat> Miriam's first reading at a fixed and free uh, event. Welcome, Miriam Sagan. much. It's just been delightful to be here and to listen to you all. I'm going to read a poem called In the Monastery of Fragrance and Panic, and it's about, um, it's about the pandemic. It's the title poem of a little chapbook of mine that was actually published in India earlier this year from Cyberwit Press. I highly recommend them. We, as you know, in New Mexico, have been, were locked down for a long time, and I created a kind of poetry game where I thought, what if I wasn't locked down because I was in a pandemic? What if I had decided to reform and I'd gone to a Zen Buddhist monastery and I was doing a hundred day practice period, um, which has been something I'm aware of. What would I do? What would I do every day? What do monks do? Well, they, they write poetry and they do housework. Uh, there might be a little more um, erotic love in this poem than is usual in monasteries, because really the poems ended up about being my own life and about a sense of containment. Um, anyway, thank you for listening. In the Monastery of Fragrance and Panic, I sat in the sand of the arroyo. There was no wave to wash my footprints away, other than time, other than the wind, other than not knowing where I was going. I remember when the children emptied the vegetable crisper and planted all the scallions in the dry wash, expecting harvest, expecting cities. These cities named and nameless come and go with the observer. We couldn't find the ruined Pueblo driving back and forth on Arroyo Hondo in the monastery of tequila and triple sec and ice cubes. I met you, my love, in bed and attempted to lick the salt off every rim. In the arroyo of awakening and regret, I crossed my legs, as did the dry bush, as did the reddish cliffs, as did the path which kept appearing and disappearing on a perfectly clear day. Thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you so much, Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. <clears throat> Next, Could you read my note? Say again? Could you read my note? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, uh, I didn't hear my name called. You sent me an email to tell me I was, uh, I thought you were saying I was uh, being included in the reading. Uh, it, Bernardo. Please, uh, please tell me your name again. Bernardo. Bernardo. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll wait until we have the, the rest of the those poets programmed, if I may. Okay. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Janet Ruth, uh, a favorite of our fiction free readings. Uh, she's a retired New Mexico ornithologist, and she has a book entitled Feathered Dreams, Celebrating Birds, in poems, stories, and images. Please welcome Janet Ruth. Thank you, Billy. Um, I think there is a bird in this poem, although this is not a bird poem. I write plenty of those. This is a poem I wrote specifically for Amit. And um, I was so glad that you ended your reading, Amit, with the um, last will and testament of the tiger, because I have borrowed your form and some of your phrases to tell a different story that you gave me permission by having written that poem to express my own outrage about. And at least for now, it's called Last Will and Testament of the Polar Bear. When you have stolen from me the last of the sea ice that paved my way to the ringed seals that sustain me, when you have thawed 
the last of the permafrost, when you have melted the last of the snow banks where I excavated caves to birth my cubs. Oh, driller of oil, consumer of fuel, improver of habitat, climate alchemist. You will have killed me as surely as if you wielded that thunder stick of old, though my death will not be as quick, as clean, or as bloody. I too have hunted and killed, but every kill was face to face with my prey. There was a chance to escape beneath the ice and some of the blood poured back into the cycle of life, a steaming sacrifice on the altar of our great icy mother. But you consume and consume and consume, driven by what you want, not what you need. Wretched alchemist, you attempt to transform beauty and diversity into gold and fleeting gratification, but are left with only a poverty of ash. So before you have consumed it all, before there is nothing left for any other being, before there is in fact nothing left, even for you, I pray that you will stand before me, look into my eyes and watch me die. I pray that you will reach deep for some tiny shred of respect and mercy left inside you and that you will leave all parts of me behind. I have ruled this frozen kingdom at our great mother's decree to kill or be killed and feed the cycle. And there is some justice in being scavenged by a re remaining Arctic fox or raven to alleviate their starvation, to, to be returned to the earth as carrion. Leave the yellowed portions of my fur to reflect the pale, never setting Arctic sun at summer solstice my black skin to darken a night sky full of stars in midwinter, the fading gleam in my eye to reflect a curtain of aurora borealis drifting down over the world's stage. You cannot hope to contain my rage, so let my roar echo through an empty world that once was filled with a symphony of sonorous whale song, walrus groans, seal barks, raven croaks, wolf howls, and the thump of willow ptarmigan wings against the snow. May my claws slash through the lies until they reach the truth. May my teeth tear the false words of promise from your books and speeches and legislation. May my bones, at least for a time, bear witness to the wonder that once was. I am so weak, I cannot remember my last meal. But even so, I could stand on my hind legs one last time before I die. I could tower, I would tower over you, your puny defenses, your puny excuses. I could break you like a twig. I could tear you flesh from bone, but you are not worth the effort. So I will draw myself around my soul, that part of me you cannot kill, that part of me which you in your blindness can't claimed only for your kind. I will join the souls of others. We will turn our backs on you and we will walk away. And when all of you are also gone, when you have died of starvation or disease, cataclysm or loneliness, then perhaps some small bit of my white fur will remain. My white fur, which is not really white, but transparent and pigment-free, scattering and reflecting light like ice and snow. Perhaps this tuft of a memory of me will drift across the land that is now so brown, over the sea that is now so dark. The world will dream of white, and our great icy mother in her frozen weeping will bring a new ice age. Thank you very Thank you. much. Beautiful, Janet. Thank you so much. Our next poet is Vijali Hamilton. For 31 years, Vijali has worked and taught around the world as an artist and peacemaker. Uh, she started her World Wheel Global Peace Through the Arts 
1986 to explore the role that community-based art can play in building a world of peace. Over 1,000 of her artworks are in museums, public places, and private collections. And she has done quite a bit of work in India, as I understand it, uh, working on building a school there. Or was it Afghanistan? I apologize if I messed that up. It was please, in please welcome Vijali Hamilton. Thank you so much. I just have been so inspired by the poetry and Amit's group of, of poems. The first time I've heard him read uh, a number of poems together and I just, I'm, I'm amazed. And I will read this one poem that is titled, The Men I Love. Dear sleep as spring warms the days, and my heart moves again after living with death. And my mind moves to the men I love. Father, three months with me. His spirit soars while body shrinks. Then finally, he takes flight. As a child, I sent love and tears to my absent father, my absent mother but no love returned. Absent the body, absent the holding, perhaps I learned to love the earth because the flesh was absent. The men I love, perhaps you today, walking in flesh and bone, you who love the earth the way I do, seeing spirit in mountains and rivers, in forests and deserts. The men I love, not God the Father in sky above, I have no love for thee out of reach, but that same spirit I love in men, walking on earth, kissing soil and stones with their feet, weeping as we all weep, when the heart spills tears for the people we love, for the uncertainty of life, for the earth being raped again and again, gang bang raped with no meaning, just greed and greed and more greed. The men I love, you, Amit, Dahi. Yabasha, excuse me if I don't pronounce it, with your voice of truth, even as COVID Delta takes your breath, your poetry still speaks through your pores, through your will to live. The men I love, Chief Sa Seattle, his heart weeping for his people, his mind seeing our future, now taking shape before our eyes, the buffalo gone, the pure water gone, the trees in the Amazon gone, the air filled with pollutants, and in time, perhaps the people gone, but, what if, what if the youth rise up, young boys, young girls, with a vision so clear, penetrating the lives we live, speaking the truth untelevised, walking the talk unspoken, singing the praises of the sacred unsung, touching our hearts unloved, while holding hands with the men I love and our whole family of earth. Thank you so much, Vijali. <clears throat> our next poet um, was the inaugural Albuquerque Poet Laureate, Hakeem Bellamy, who also uh, is a multi Multiple, multiple time champion in uh, slam poetry. 
a magnificent performance poetry, Hakeem Bellamy. Thank you, Billy. Can you guys hear me? I am uh, I'm kind of in transit and now also waiting for my my poems to um, close because they're taking like a, a long time right now. So give me a second. There we go. So um, and thank you, Vitaly. That was amazing. Um, I'm I'm I'm, in, I'm sending you love, brother, for the recovery, um, for the additional recovery, and sending love to all of us in the pandemic trying to navigate this and uh, doing so in home and in community. So thank you to all the organizers for bringing this together as well. Uh, two short poems, because you know, known as a slam poet, so usually extra wordy, but two very short poems that were written in the pandemic that haven't actually had a time to, a lot of time to write in the pandemic. So the first one's called Invisible Blood and the other one's called Home. Invisible Blood, the storm. The last time the world purged itself, we were water broke. This go round money broke. Two of anything became difficult to come by, particularly mass. Some say the reset was so necessary that the birds, immune to economic sterilization, somehow miraculously tripled their population overnight. Boomers, evidenced by the earnest of their song. I don't know if there were actually more of them, or whether they were simply singing louder or if it was just silence. Four. Home. Home has taken on a different meaning in the past few months used to mean the opposite of lonely. It used to mean favorite place for coffee and conversation, favorite happy hour and bakery, favorite place to buy books, boots, favorite place to watch bands and balloons. It used to mean the mandatory breakfast burrito no matter what time of day, immediately upon landing after the return flight, who the hell cares? What happens when hometown means ghost town? When you no longer have access to your favorite haunt? You realize home is more than a place. It is the people we are missing. It means together is the opposite of alone. And together we survive the illest econ class of our lives and left having learned that commerce is so much more than a steady supply of transactions. It is a current of interpersonal interactions that never really begins with the human taking action. So here we stand still together, still, with nothing but two keeping handfuls of future, soberingly aware that our strength in numbers is really all we've ever had, and we still got it. Thank you. Much love. Thank you very much, Hakeem. We have two more scheduled poets. Uh, first, uh, please welcome Lou Similor, a uh, gentle giant with a head of hair and a beard that I envy. <laughs> Take it away, Lou, please. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Amit, and, and everyone for a lovely night of poetry. Blessings, Amit. May your golden heart shine on through the sun, the moon, the earth, and stars. Um, this poem is called Things I Missed, Things I've Missed. I miss the times when we ate together during the holidays. The frittatas of morning, the turkey and gravy and mashed potatoes covered with red chili of Thanksgiving, the football game between Westerly and Stonington, the cookies and soprasat and bread of Easter with the child face of the baby Jesus in every child's face, represented by a loaf of soft bread and a single hard boiled egg standing in for Jesus's face and our faces too. The chocolates and heart-shaped pizza of Valentine's Day. 
the sweet tasting Zeppoli of St. Joseph's Day, the pasta and bacala of Christmas Eve, the banana fritters, sausage, and bacon of Christmas morning, the snacks and commercials of Super Bowl Sunday, the black-eyed peas and pozole of New Year, all these delicious flavors, textures and smells, the filling, filling, filling me with pleasure, I do miss so, but there's much more, so much more of, of time spent with the people I love and treasure. We are bound together with memories and laughter. It's all this I miss and more. The crunchiness of family, the delectability of friends, the sweet savory nuttiness of those I hold dear. I'm looking forward to the day we'll come together once again and taste the joys of each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lou. And now for our last scheduled poet, we have Zachary Kluckman, who currently, uh, some, actually several years ago, established a uh, poetry group entitled Mind Well. And um, he is currently president of the New Mexico State Poetry Society. Please welcome Zachary Kluckman. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Uh, what, a, what a beautiful evening of poetry this has been so far. Um, I apologize that my camera was off earlier. I didn't want to uh, appear rude, but I'm raising my grandbaby now, too. So uh, there was a lot of ah, this going on. Um, so <laughs> um, I uh, have honestly been trying to figure out what to read tonight. You know, it's always hard as you're inspired and moved by the poems before you. Um, so I am going to... Uh, I think read this one actually. Um, and this is uh, sort of a piece that, that sim symbolizes what the pandemic has been for me. It's actually um, coming out in print in, a, in, in the New Writing Scotland issue here soon. Um, but it is, uh, well, I'll just let it speak for itself. It's called Break in Case of Silence. When fireflies dance from the open wound of your mouth. When you have talked graves free of their bones. Dug wasps from their homes. Stung truth with a raw tooth. When grief has bitten your hand for feeding at the names of the lost. When you have found a secret garden within the reckless brambles of your heart. Where the silence deepens until trees wail by comparison. When you carry fear like a corpse because the smell is more familiar than flowers. When the rain digs songs from the mud. When scars are rubbed for their genies until blood appears under your nails. When your mother takes up magic and learns only one trick. How to open the earth with her body and be swallowed. When your voice is a love note written inside of a kite. An attempt to sweeten the sky. When the string breaks, have you seen how they dance, fireflies? How they treat the small space inside of jars to the movement of light? How they burn whether their world shatter or not? How the lightning must have spoken to their mothers? How their bodies lift from the earth? How the earth fell over her body? The grasshoppers with their bagpipes, the world with its drunken spin, how they stop, how you learned from your mother's tongue, the words of passing, but also the music of laughter, but also the sweet scent of grass from her lungs, her strength, speak them for the spring, for the passing of light through the trees. Even if the words hang like bruised fruit from your teeth, even if the shadows crawl from the ground into your arms, this is natural. This is the wisdom of bodies, to hold what is dead close to the heart, to break the silence with the only voice you have left. Thank you. 
All right, let's everyone unmute and applaud and cheer for one another for a wonderful Yay. evening. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Yay. Beautiful. Yeah. Way to go. So and let's give our let's give our blessings and our love and our our good wishes to our brother, our poet brother Amit Dahi about Dabi. <laughs> Dahi Abadsha. I've said that so many times, I knew it by heart. Dahi Abadsha. Thank you. That, that's okay, I believe. My mom had a hard time with the name. As well. <laughs> I'm going to put in the in the chat one more time uh, where you can donate. Uh, please do so generously. It will all get to Amit uh, within a few days of my receiving it, within actually usually within a couple hours of when I receive it. And um, several people have indicated a, a desire to read another poem. So if you do, please put your name in the chat. I think we can uh, handle a couple more poems. For those of you who are past your bedtime, we will not uh, hold it against you if you need to leave but um billy billy can i interrupt for a moment i i i think i'd like i'd really like to hear from bernardo bernardo think, uh, like bernard bernardo is reading and i think that scott norman wanted to read as well go ahead bernardo uh thank you billy uh i, I reread the email man apparently your email just said it, thank you for registering uh, there was no indication that I was scheduled, so my bad. I didn't mean to bring any bad feelings to this man because it's all about a meet, and I, I'm 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 about healing, you know. We're we're ahead of schedule anyway, Bernardo. So don't don't worry about it. There are no hard feelings here, Bernardo. Go for Thank it. You, Thank you, brother. Uh, I was about to say that uh, my name is Bernardo. I am a poet, sing song poet from Laurel, Maryland. And I followed the yellow brick road to get here from a friend called Hiram LaRue through Tortiga to Billy Brown to meet poets I already knew and Josephine K. Hall and Don Krieger to meet I meet. And um, it was a very beautiful read and I'm, I'm very impressed. By, from my understanding, um, it was about the COVID situation. So I, I, brought, I prepared a couple poems, they're short, uh, to, um, to express that because I believe that we are going through a natural, a natural phenomenon which feels unnatural to us, but it's taking place and, and our job is to survive this. So first of all, I begin by reaching out. This poem is called The Broadcast. Checking in, this is me. Radio frequency of one, two, three, four, five, still alive on a planet called Orator in the great state of hope. From the city called Elevation in the county of Elevator, here I broadcast fast concepts, connection to the spirit, trying to affect the darkness of being alone. We cannot touch except through thought and so we think we're on our own. In this realm, I found my breakthrough. Let me take you to the men. Elevator, Elevation, Hope. Orator, still alive. One, two, three, four, five. The frequency. This is me checking in. Mm. This next one I wrote in the very beginning. Little did I did I expect that there would be a resurgence, but I believe that we have to take everything we're dealing with right here, right now, one day at a time, like we take life. We are coronavirus survivors. For now, we have not succumbed, been overcome. Grace has allowed another day to face the sun, to put hands to plow, to do the work inserted deep inside of us. We must trust to find the thrust that will bring us through. For Yahweh knows the thing he created us to do. Today is what we have to find a way to laugh, to smile to cease from worrying and find peace. For we are coronavirus survivors. 
for now. And I pray everybody keeps surviving. And uh, this last piece um, is from my, my, my chat book. Um, it was written to as an expression of me finding the contrast of darkness to light one night when I was lost on a highway. And it has become a poem that people recognize as a way of saying goodbye. If the sun must set, let me remember it was bright and hold this recollection deep into the night and aid me in recalling the way that it gave sight. Reveal to me the truth, the way of this great light to pause in the reflection how it rises from the right and grows and grows in all it shows in reaching to his height. Freely shares the blessings of awareness, growth and might. If the sun must set, let me remember it was bright. Assist me in remembrance, sun came forth bringing morn and beaming down from heaven, touched earth and made it warm. Radiating unto seeds, new life therein was formed. In places where there was no life, this same source brought forth scorn. Sun causes rainbows to come out in mist or after storms. Inspired me, as you can see, that I should write this poem. As I look unto a book called Life, though the page is worn, knowledge firm concerning sunset death rise means reborn. If the sun must set, then please remind me it will rise. If not in this place I see, then on the other side. The story told another way, behold the ocean's tide. And energy stored up in me, teach me to pace my stride. The light placed in the soul of me was not put there to hide. Teach me not to fear or give instruction using pride. I know by saying I don't know, there's room I might be wise. If the sun must set, then please remind me, it will rise. Thank you all. Ahmed, thank you for your wonderful words, man. I'm glad to meet you. I'm glad to meet you all. Likewise. Likewise here. Yes, same here. Uh, Scott, wish it, I believe, wishes Wait, to read. Uh, yes, Scott? Yes, yes. And then after that, uh, Kate. Uh, Kate can go before me if you like. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll go, I'll go first. Um, these days, everything is so torn apart. If you, if you either have, seems that you're driven to take one side or the other. And I don't know, but anyway, this is, um, I mean, I'm going to sing this even though it's a poem because you brought it up. <laughs> this is a letter of congratulations to Polly Davies, March 2008, for Julia Otts and for Quinn Brisbane. One, we all live in history in a place called the world. My name is Scott, you don't need to dread not my voice or messages from this part of the world. It's referred somewhere in the Talmud. If you save the life, you save the world. Two, once upon a time, 11 people got arrested near a house. A judge lived in the house. 200 or so people stood between a man and a death chamber. Most of the people went away. 11 chose to confront. Word from council said that we pulled it off. Jim Bevel did it again. New reason for a maverick to be vilified. Talk and hypocrisy. Otherwise, those who didn't confront 
might be those who ran away. I almost left a worthless life, a muted voice in the jail in the cold. It wouldn't look bad for what we were doing. Three, once upon a time, I intruded on an evening. You provided information to move beyond corruption into the decades through the world. For a worthless life, a muted voice, I won't apologize that intrusion. We've learned better than that. I'll congratulate you, Ms. Polly, for saving the world. Thank you, Scott. Lovely voice. Kate, are you ready? Hi, born ready. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Still haven't gotten sleep from that last message. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. That was incredible. What an honor. Way to go. Sing in the morning. Peace into place. There beneath my feet is rich and dark soil. Many moons raised the old compost pile, digging deep to reap her moist, wormy worth, filling wheelbarrows, planting new beginnings. Their heritage long ago turned and toiled, a generation has left its earthly place, digging deep into the rank and file, goose stepped unwittingly for the commandant. <laughs> there beneath my feet are old musty children's books meant for merriment, glee, and sleep. Sway learning lessons, dodging banishment as an obedient child now outspoken, reuniting in truth revealed, there survives a bond of grace between love and hope. May multitudes never cease to turn peace into place. Thank you very much, Amit. Thank you very much, everybody that joined Amit with unified love and hope and healing and peace. I hold your hand, Amit. I hold your hand. GE, would you like to read? Yes, thank you so very, very much. I, I hadn't planned to. I came to listen, but I... But I, I'd love to because I, I love this man. I love his voice. I love his work. And it's meant a lot to me uh, over the last few months since I first uh, first heard him back in um, in December on the cultivating uh, line. This is breathing without exhales. This is unbearable, we say, while doing just that. Reading our lips as if the shapes settled like letters like wax wings on a branch baseline. Nothing is lost from the lines or the photographs. No amount of reading wears them away, lips or no lips, jams or I am's, looking so similar in lowercase. The cathedral is upheld, stone humming, ribs vaulting, insinuation and insinuation at the same time. Credo, I believe, and daddy-o, how meaning interlocks, interlocks with stones as the birds settle into limestone cornices, some things inside out as gothic, outside in as socks, 
wrong-sided, red-winged blackbird, black-winged redbird, tanagers. The idea mirror is held up to. Alas, alas, I write out love to you in flying words, leaving like water. It settles on my hand, on your hips. I can hardly stand it. I say, while standing it, thank you. Thank you, GE. All right, everyone, uh, once more, unmute and uh, cheer everyone on and cheer on Amit. I need, to, I need to end this. And I have a sweetheart waiting for me in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.